Hey guys, what is up? This is Mike Rosada and this is the second installment of my video on currying in JavaScript. I told you that in this video, we're gonna write more code than we did before because in the last video, if you weren't here, you should go back and watch. We learned how to write our own curry implementation and this week we wanna see what sort of magical powers this curry implementation is gonna give us and the only way to test out magical powers is to write code and use them. Real quick, if you don't know what curry does, I'm just gonna do a real quick example. We're gonna call this the hello world of curry. It takes three arguments, whoa. It takes <laughs> three arguments and it console logs out hello and then it logs A, B, and C. So we know that normally if I call hello world with anything, it's going to log out hello, whatever I passed in, and it's going to fill in undefined for the rest of it. So now I'm going to wrap this instead in our awesome hello world curry. Now, when we call this, nothing should come up. If we call it again, we're only up to two arguments, we need three, so nothing should come up. It doesn't. Now, later in our program, I could have just tacked this on the end, but I didn't show this in the last video. This is how we would normally we'd have these calls separated. Well, let's just shush me, run it. Hello, to the 10 world. All right, so that's what currying does. It delays the execution of a function and it partially applies the values we pass it into the parameters so that when we finally call it with the final parameter, it applies the function over all those terms. And that is the magic. But just because it's magic doesn't mean it's useful, right? Because there's a lot of magic tricks that you wouldn't even watch or you don't care about. But then there's some like David Blaine magic that's really awesome. And that's the type of stuff that we're after today. So let's write some code. Let's write some functions. First, let's write our number one buddy, Sum, and his pal, Mult. Now, I guess it would be beneficial to us to curry these off the bat, but I was kind of thinking that maybe if I do that, I'm going to miss an opportunity to show where currying would have come in handy, and then we could rescue the situation with curry. Either way, we're going to curry them eventually. So let's take this basket and let's get the name of the items from the basket. We'll use those names to get the prices of the items and then multiply those prices by the quantities. It sounds pretty good. Sounds like I actually have that planned out a little bit. So hopefully we don't run into too many bugs or errors. Items. And the items are gonna, gonna have to get those from the baskets. So we're going to map over the basket. If you don't know about map, I just put out a video about map. You go watch that. We're going to map over the basket and we're going to take from it the prop name. What is this prop name function? Well, believe it or not, this is going to be our first curried lambda function that we write in a real program as a team, just me and you's. So that's our prop function is going to take the name of the property and then when we call it again with an object it will pass back that property and actually we're going to create another function called get that's going to take an object and a name put that up here get object it's basically the same thing backwards 
I think is a good way to do it because this is kind of the traditional way to grab something from an object. We usually do like object dot name, object dot prop. This seems backwards, so both of these will come in handy. I actually think they're both probably going to come in handy in this video, so I don't know. We'll see at the end if we use them both. I think we will. Now, one of the benefits of abstracting logic into these functions is that in a traditional program, you see a lot of like if type of this is undefined, if this is null, if this equals object, you see that littered all over the place. And I'm not knocking it because it needs to be there or things would be crashing all the time. With functional programming, we're elevating ourselves to a higher level of being. We are building higher order functions. We're elevating, and I'm not just saying that. We really are elevating. We're going to a higher level of abstraction. We're writing our code at a higher level. So we don't have to have all that error checking. We can put it in one place. Like if we want to make sure that we're not grabbing properties from an object that's really not an object, well, we could just check that in one place and we can make that place right here. So let's make sure that object is an object. And then we can return a property from it. And if not, then we'll return undefined. So that's the only place that we need to actually like write that. And that's cool. We don't have to write it in a hundred different places throughout our program. Mm -hmm. so we also, we can abstract that part. We can make an is object function that'll take one argument and just check that an object. So that's another abstraction that we just made. We can use it right here. Is object object. If it is, try to get this property from it. And we could keep going crazy and we could check if the property exists and this and that. But it's better to wait until like we run into a problem because this seems like a fine solution right now for what we're doing. So our prop function back to this. We're mapping over basket with this, which is a curried function, prop. We passed in name, which means that we got back a function, which is essentially just this highlighted part that I have. The name's already there. So once we call this function with an object, it's gonna grab the name property off that object. The objects we're passing in one at a time are going to be this thing up here and then this one underneath, and then that. Let me shut my trapper, and let's run it. And I'm gonna write one more function. This function is called tap. I've heard other people call it trace. Basically, this is a console log. I like to put a label in it, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna console log our val and it's going to console log our label this is good for debugging and then it's just going to return the value and the purpose of this is just that we now have a function when we're chaining together these maps we can add a tap and it'll show us what our value is we'll put a label call it item make a little cool arrow let's run this Let's see where we stand. This is where we stand. So now we've already taken advantage of one, two card functions, and we've been able to map out our items from our shopping basket. The next thing that we need to do, or that we should do, is get the prices for these items. Or let's get the quantities for these items. How about that? So QTYs, that'll be quantities. We're gonna map over the basket again. So this time, we just need to get the quantity. And we could even tap it out. Q 
QTY, a little arrow. Let's run it. And here we go. And this is just good. You can see how this program is flowing right now. So we're taking an array. We're mapping over it one item at a time, passing that item or that object into our curried prop function, which is pulling out the name. We're doing the identical thing with the quantities. And now we need a way to, one, get the prices from this, and then we're going to multiply them with these quantities. I guess we could start with the prices. So prices, this is probably going to be a no-brainer, although you should never say that until you try it or you make a fool out of yourself on video. Prices is items mapped. And we're actually going to have to map it to... Yeah, that's it, actually. So, right, because we're already get. This time we're using get. I knew we were going to use get. I said that we were going to use it. Now we're using it. So that's why it's good to have these double implementations, right? It's just the same thing with the signature reversed. And this code function, it's just a getter for our prices object. Anything we pass into it, any string, provided it's up here, it's going to return a price. And thanks to our good error checking, if it's not in the prices, then it's going to return undefined. Why don't we check this real quick? I had Chai loaded and I took it out because I didn't want to write too many tests on you guys this time. So this is console log. Well, since we're using this twice, I'm going to abstract this out. We're going to call it get price. Let's move it up here. So we're going to console log get price banana. Oh man. B A N A. <laughs> Let's run it. We might get an error because of this. Oh wait. Is it because it is because of that? Let me comment that out real quick. So right down here, we're getting undefined. It's because we don't have a price for banana. Let's put in game. Let's run it. It's good to test out our stuff. 59.95. That's the price of a game. It's a lot of money. It's actually not that bad. I think that's the price they've been at for over a decade now. We're used to it. We don't mind. We quit gaming to play programming anyway, right? I know I did. So now we know how to get prices. So we're going to map our items onto our get price, but that seems to throw an error before. Why did that error happen? Let's see. Nintendo controller game. So that is our items array. Oh, you know why I threw the error? If I just read, I could have told you it anyway. We had two, I had, not going to blame you, two constants named prices. So now that's working. If you want, we can map out price. If you want, if I want, you really don't have a say in it at the moment. But you could change the video if you didn't like it. So now we have our prices. We have the items. And I want to point out something important. You're probably smart enough to pick this up. But these are all in the proper order. Nintendo, that's the price for Nintendo. That's the quantity. Controller, price, quantity, bop, bop, bop. So what can we do with this? How can we, in a neat way get the total for this person and check them out. They've been waiting in line on a digital site for like an hour now. They are very patient. You're very, very, very patient. We don't want to just, like we don't want to write a loop and add these up. We want to do this in a functional-ish way. So another cool function that we can write 
I think for that, uh, we wouldn't want to cover yet. So this is called Zip. I don't know if you've seen Zip before. Zip is going to take some arrays. And actually, before we write Zip, I'm just going to show you what it should be. And this is in, I think it's in both Ramda and Lodash. So you don't have to write, you don't have to write a lot of these functions yourself. But it's good to get used to them so you know how to write them, how they work. So imagine we had an array that looked like that, and we had an array that looked like this. So if we put them through a zip, this is what we would want to get back. We'd want to get a multi-dimensional array that put each of the index of the arrays together. They're zipped up. And actually, if you write Python, Python has a native implementation of zip. So that's zip. So the way we could write that, so we're going to take in some arrays. I already explained the spread operator in the last video. And if you weren't watching, I'm going to assume that you know what it is. It just collects all the parameters into an array. So if we took the length of this array, made a new array, stick with me for one second while I just think this out. So we're going to fill that with empty arrays. So I just want to put this back up so you guys can kind of look at that and I can look at it to explain what's going on. So I'm going to make a new array. I'm going to fill it with arrays. So if we pass in these two arrays, then this first array has a length of three. We'd basically be creating this, except without these. They'd be empty. All right, so we take that. We're going to return that. If you want to see it, I'll just show you what we have so far. This might actually be more educational. So we're passing in that. Passing in that. Let's run it. So we're just getting back this. And that's perfect. Now we just have to fill it up. Well, we have to fill up the fill. Fill just fills an array, all its indexes with an item. You could do some other stuff with it too. Don't even worry about it. I don't want to waste your time with it at this moment. So map. We're going to map over this array. And for each item, we are going to collect these, drop them in. The way we could do that, let me think for one second. So the way we could do that, we would take arrays, would we reduce them? We need to get the first index or whatever index we're on. We're going to want to pull it out. So from map, we're going to want to return arrays.map. I think this actually could be what we call money. Find out it is. That is what we call money, what we call zip. So normally, I'm not saying that this would hold up like in every environment or whatever, but for us, it's going to work. So why do we care about this zip? What are we going to do with it? Well, Let's zip together our prices and our quantities. So we can say zip item prices and zip that with quantities. Let's just console log out prices, quantities, run it. Here it is. So price, quantity, price. Quantity. 
So now I feel like we're getting very close to where we want to be. We don't have too much left to do. We just need to multiply these together. And that feels like a job for map. And then we could reduce. We can map it and then we could reduce it. So let's map to. We're going to map to multiply. However, since it's a, an array, I don't think that we can do this. Pretty darn sure we can't do that. But we definitely can do this. Take prices. I should stop using that word. So we can take our items and we can multiply apply and let's tap it out map tap sub totals let's just see if that worked it should have multiplied them together giving us the prices and it did 399 times 1 is 399 49 99 times 3 etc etc so that worked out pretty well but this doesn't look that good it looks kind of ugly so we could abstract this out I think a good way to maybe do that let's call this apply we'll pass in mult just move this up here. So apply is going to take function and then it'll take items and it'll return back that function applied to the items. We definitely need to curry it. So we're using our curry superpower once more and it's helping us get through this little jam cross the fingers, run it, it worked. So now we have our totals, our subtotals rather. I'm gonna get rid of all this map tapping so that we can see our nice clean code. I don't think we need to save that. We just to subtotals. So now we have our subtotals in an array. If we want to get either our totals or we can get totals with taxes. Taxes, yep. So a good way to do that, I guess, would be to reduce it, get one singular price, and then multiply it by the tax rate, add that to the price. Or we could do it item by item, but obviously that would take longer. So for the sake of our time and the computational time of the computer, let's just do subtotals, reduce, and we're going to reduce it using our sum function. I don't think we actually have to curry this, to be honest. Let's see. We shouldn't have to because if you don't know, reduce takes a function and it'll go through this array and it'll pass in one item each time and it'll add it to whatever our previous accumulator was. I'm sure you know how it goes. I'm just going to show you very quickly. So we have our current item. Basically, it just returns the accumulator plus the current item. Well, that's what we're going to return. And then it just cycles around. I'm going to throw a breakpoint in here. I'm going to run this over here in our debugger. We can see that it is frozen. And we have our current item plus our accumulator, which has a default of zero. 
And that's a good thing to do. You don't have to throw a default in, but if you're doing stuff like math, it's a good idea. Continue execution. It's going to get called again. So now our accumulator is 399 because we added 399 plus zero. Our current item is 149. It's going to add those two together. That becomes what it's returned. So then on the next run through, that is the accumulator. And then this last time, it's going to add this. And that's what gets returned from our reduction. That is our total. So we can take this out because we already have, even though if you ever are writing a reducer and you look at it and you're like, geez, that looks very familiar. Well, you might have it in a utility function and we definitely do. That I know for a fact, it's called sum. We've been using it a lot. So let's console log total. We can't tap total. And the reason we can't tap it is because it's a number. It would throw an error. Whew. That's a lot of guapamula. $789.76. And we still have to calculate the taxes. I don't even think we have to do anything very fancy for that. I don't know why I'm console logging when we have a function called tap. So we want to show this person a receipt. We're going to show them the total. We're going to show them their subtotal this is their subtotal though actually we're going to show them their tax So we just need to get our tax and our subtotal. We could actually write a function for get tax. And we could use curry. Is malt curried? No, it's not. We will curry that. We'll pass in tax rate. We'll curry this function. And if we curry this function, then now we have a get tax function that is malt preloaded with the first parameter has our tax rate in it so we just have to do get tax on subtotal and even though we're writing like a functionalish style it's not actual functional programming because we're still doing things one line after the next and in the next video we'll talk about composition and composition is going to remove a lot of this stuff that's just like line after line of junk. And we're going to compose it into these beautiful symphonies of code. But I think you've already seen how powerful Curry is. Why won't he just stop talking and calculate this so we can go to bed? So what do we need? The total which is a sum of our subtotal and our tax. This should be it. This should be all she wrote. There's our receipt. So we really just got to see the power of our curry implementation. We got to see the power of higher order functions. I want to point one other thing out to you guys. So I wrote app up here. But in actuality, this is our app down here. Because all this stuff here is utils. This is all stuff that we're going to use again and again and again. And if we're not using this, we're using something just like it. But the point is we're not always rewriting that code. So this is really the only unique stuff to our app. And we could probably, trying to figure out the time, we can rewrite this and make it a little bit smaller. I actually think I'm just going to leave you guys with this. Let this simmer. You should hold on to this stuff here. Because as I said, we'll reuse that stuff. Or you could get rid of it. 
try to write this out yourself and then save your own versions of them. But the thing to take away from this is that currying is power. If this seemed a little foreign to you, the mapping, I think you should go check out my video on mapping and filtering and reducing. And that way, when I release the video for composition, you will just be a bad mamma jamma, ready to write some functional code, ready to step up your game. We're going to be doing a lot of cool things coming up. I'm going to turn you into JavaScript masters. I hope that I learn something teaching you guys as well. I'm having a lot of fun. Have a great week. Any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Take it easy.